All right, good evening, everybody. My name is Carolina Navarro. I'm the Deputy Director for the Horological Society of New York, and it's my pleasure to welcome you this evening for our September lecture. Before we get started, we just have a few quick announcements about the Society. September classes are now live. We're gonna be hosting weekend weekday classes upstairs on the fifth floor of the General Society, September 13th, 27th, and 29th. Traveling education is confirmed for Silicon Valley in September and Boston in October. They're filling up fast, so if you're interested in a place, please visit our website to reserve a seat at the bench. As always, we also offer virtual classes around the world, and you can visit our website to learn more. Our annual summer survey is also here, and if you haven't already, please take a few moments to answer some questions to help us with future planning. When you go to our website, you can just click on this image here and it'll take you directly to the survey, which is gonna be live until the last official day of summer, which is September 22nd. Last but not least, we have an exciting new exhibit. It's titled Watches from the James Arthur Collection. The exhibit is also located upstairs at the HSNY um, headquarters on the fifth floor and you can schedule an appointment on our website. And we have some great timepieces on display and we encourage everybody to join and take a look. Okay, and now for our lecture. Tonight's topic, as you all know, is gonna be on the quartz crisis, particularly what happened and how the industry was impacted. Here to present is Hyla Ames Bauer, who you may know as a watch and jewelry writer based in New York. Everyone, please welcome and, joining me, and join me in welcoming Hyla to the podium. Thanks, Carolina. Um, hi, everyone. Thank you so much uh, for all of you being here, both in person and out there in Zoom land. Um, thank you. I'd like to ask before we get started, did anyone get the memo about wearing a Swatch watch? I see a show of wrists. Okay, great, thanks. Uh, we'll find out a little later what that's all about. Um, I did see on Instagram that there was one comment that somebody's gonna be wearing a Seiko, which is fine. There's nothing wrong with Seiko, um, but anyway, uh, you're, you're fine here. You're accepted, we're all accepted here. Um, so tonight, as Carolina said, I'll be speaking to you about the quartz crisis of the 1970s and early 80s in Switzerland. The quartz crisis marked a decade that dealt a devastating economic blow to the Swiss watch industry. Watch brands, their employees, suppliers were all affected as the demand for Swiss made mechanical watches plummeted. The demand for Swiss watches tanked because of the introduction of quartz watches specifically from Japan. Japanese quartz watches sold like hotcakes and the Swiss suffered dearly from the consequences. From 1970 to 1983, the number of watchmaking companies in Switzerland fell by nearly two thirds from 1,600 to just 600. 1,000 companies closed their doors for good, leaving just 600 surviving. The human cost in terms of employment and earning loss was even more tragic. In 1970, about 90,000 people were employed in the watchmaking industry in Switzerland. As the demand for Swiss watches dried up, the watch companies had no choice but to lay off employees. As a result, more than two thirds of the workers lost their jobs. By the early 1980s, only 28,000 people were still working in the watchmaking industry um, from down from 90,000, marking a loss of 62,000 jobs. People whose entire careers were spent in watchmaking had nowhere to turn. Things were looking grim. The introduction of quartz movement timepieces from Japan proved to be the ruinous to the Swiss watch industry. From recovery from what we call the quartz crisis was a slow and painful process spanning more than a decade. Here we go into depth through the history of the quartz crisis from the Swiss brand's precipitous collapse in the early 1970s through their so slow and hard work born recovery. 
So at today's talk, I'll be uh, focusing on what I'd like to call the before times. So before the tragedy, um, so we'll talk a little bit about uh, Swiss and European watchmaking. Um, then we'll get into the great fall of the 1970s. Um, I'll also be explaining a little bit about how a quartz watch differs from a mechanical one. Um, and then finally, the recovery, the post-crisis recovery in Switzerland. The Before Times, A Brief History of Swiss and European Watchmaking. No, oh, Carolina, there's like a bar across. I don't know if you're seeing it up there. Okay, well, it's on, it's on the screen here. I'll try to keep going. Um, okay, so watchmaking in the 1800s. You see that? Um, watchmaking was very much a personal occupation. Um, people handed down watchmaking skills from generation to generation. Um, and in the 1800s, of course, there was no electricity. So watchmakers needed to be in a place with um, a lot of natural light. So it, you see in these two pictures, these watchmakers are in front of very big windows. Um, <laughs> On to the next week. Okay, so um, while we're waiting, but just okay. All right. Make sure. Um, the, the Switzerland's uh, Jura Mountains were a specific uh, uh, favorite place for some of the watchmakers because of these beautiful vistas, um, and also the mountains provided a lot of natural light from dawn to dusk, the watchmakers could kind of, you know, follow the light all throughout the day. Um, while Geneva was a commercial center for the watch business, a large portion of the watchmakers, as I said, lived up in this picturesque area of the Jura Mountains. Of course, sorry, other countries, especially Britain and France, also had their own star watchmakers. You've all heard of the legendary Abraham Louis Breguet. Breguet was actually born in Neuchâtel in Switzerland. And he is considered to be one of the top watchmakers of all time. Breguet moved from Neuchâtel to Paris as a young man. He developed the first successful self-winding watches and was responsible for the introduction of gongs for minute repeating watches. His crowning achievement and what he's most famous for is the tourbillon, as most of you know, which was patented in 1801. In this slide is a picture of one of Breguet's high complication wristwatches. Um, here we have a couple of famous clients of Breguet's. Um, to your left, you see uh, the Queen of Naples. Breguet made actually the first witch wrist watch ever for the Queen, um, which she's probably wearing in this picture. And for Napoleon, uh, he made a clock that Napoleon could keep on his train to tell the time while he was traveling to his battles. Now we have another French watchmaker also in the early 1900s, um, Mr. Louis Cartier. Mr. Cartier had a great friend who was a pilot whose name was Alberto Santos Dumont. Mr. Dumont um, was one of the very first uh, pilots of the age or of any time. Um, and he complained to his friend, Mr. Cartier, that he really couldn't see um, his watch or work with his pocket watch while he was flying. Um, so that was a problem because if you look down at your watch, you know, you, you're not paying attention to where you're going and that could be kind of disastrous. Um, so to help his friend out, Mr. Cartier designed it a square flat wristwatch that Mr. Dumont could strap around his wrist. Um, he was filmed flying for 21.5 seconds around Paris. And this is about as fast as most of the flights were, were going at this time. Um, not to not mention Oyster, 
uh, Rolex, which of course no uh, watch presentation should be without. Um, Rolex's founder, Hans Wilsdorf, lived in London. He famously crafted the Oyster watch. I'm sure a lot of you have one. Um, and it, he declared it to be waterproof. He was eager to promote the Oyster and prove that it was indeed waterproof. Wilsdorf learned of top swimmer Mercedes Glitze, and you see her here. She's the first woman to successfully swim across the English Channel. When uh, Wilsdorf heard of her accomplishment, he thought, what a perfect way to prove that my new Oyster watch is waterproof. He contacted Mercedes and gave her a watch, and on her ne next swim in the English Channel, she wore it. And uh, sure enough, when she got out of the water, uh, the clock was still ticking. So here you see um, an ad for the Rolex Oyster, the world's first waterproof watch case. Okay, all the while, watchmakers were toiling away in Switzerland, pr producing thousands of watches and movements per year. During World War II, Switzerland became a neutral country and did not have to carry uh, its manufacturing capabilities to the war effort. This meant that they could continue on concentrating on making watches, which is what they do best. From the start of World War II in 1939 until well after its official end in 1945, watchmaking carried on in Switzerland, unaffected by the ravages of the war. So here we have a slide showing uh, mechanical watches, which is what Switzerland had been maining, making for centuries, um, and a new quartz watch made by Seiko. So here on the right, this is a Patek Philippe hand-wound mechanical watch. In the center is an Omega watch, which is an automatically round watch. And on your right is Seiko, which is powered by a battery. Before the advent of quartz watches, all watches were mechanical. Mechanical watches rely on the outside source of energy, whether they are hand wound, hand wound or automatic winding. A person has to wind a watch in order for it to run. An automatic winding watch will wind itself with the movement of the owner's wrist, but still a person has to wear an automatic watch in order to keep it wound. I have a short video here to explain the difference between manual and mechanic. They are also often called hand-wound movements because in order to keep them moving, they have to be wound by hand daily in order to create energy in the watch's main spring. Manual movements are often beloved for their complex and beautifully crafted springs and gears, usually displayed through a watch's case back. These aspects enchant watch connoisseurs and watchmakers, thus making manual wind movements the most preferred type of movement. They are often found in expensive, collectible, and conservative timepieces. Along with manual wind movements is the other type of mechanical movement, the automatic movement, also called the self-winding movement. This movement was introduced in the early 20th century. It harnesses kinetic energy from the natural motion of the wearer's wrist. Thus, moving your wrists around while you're wearing the watch will wind the main spring and keep the watch running. How does an automatic movement accomplish this? It does so with a metal weight called the rotor, which is added to the manual parts. The rotor most often comes in a semicircular weight that swings 360 degrees as the wrist moves, consequently winding the main spring and keeping the watch powered. With automatic movements, the ritual of daily winding isn't necessary. As long as one wears the watch often, the watch will continue to get wound, 
Okay, so in our previous slide, we saw a manual wound movement and then um, the automatic movement with uh, the omega. Um, so before quartz watches appeared, um, watch wearers were accustomed to winding their watches. People really didn't give it a second thought. Um, they just were winding your wa their watches. That was just how it worked. However, these new quartz watches appeared and quartz watches don't need the wearer's attention. The quartz watch's movement's energy, energy source is within the watch itself in the form of a battery. A quartz watch doesn't require the human touch at all. It can go and go and go all on its own until the battery runs out. A quartz watch is autonomous and runs independently of its owner. A quartz watch doesn't need an ongoing steady relationship with its wearer in order to function. Quartz watch owner can completely ignore their watch, throw it in a drawer, for example, and it will continue keeping time on its own until the battery runs out. <clears throat> watch batteries tend to last a while, at least a year or more. You can break up with your quartz watch and it will still be waiting patiently for you, faithfully ticking away on its own. The mechanical watch, however, won't tolerate a breakup. If you leave it alone, it will stop working for you then it requires work on your part to get going again. So there were some early quartz movements made in Switzerland um, and being developed uh, before the whole Japanese crisis happened. So one of the most notable of these is a quartz desk clock that Patek Philippe made that was pre pre presented to John F. Kennedy during his visit to Berlin in 1963. So this watch, as you see, there's no wire. Then the, the batteries are all um, contained within the clock. Um, John F. Kennedy accepted the clock and said, thank you. Um, I don't know if you all remember, but there was a very funny part of his speech where he said, ich bin ein Berliner, thinking that he meant I'm a Berliner, but it turns out he was saying, I am a donut. So I think the trip was successful, but uh, there was a little flub up there. Patek Philippe again um, created this Navicourt's uh, clock in the mid 70s. Now this clock was originally uh, made to go on board a ship. Um, its quartz movement would be, make it more accurate uh, than a regular mechanical movement would. Um, so as you see on the right, on the left, here's this beautiful box and just sold at Tiffany's. And then here on the right, here's where you have, there's a diagram here of the movement and you can see part of the conductors over here. We'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. Please. Okay, so the Swiss were, even though it's Japanese, we're working much harder on this. The Swiss were um, looking to create quartz movements, um, more of like a scientific experiment, something they were curious about. Um, it wasn't on the, the front burner in terms of urgency for the Swiss watchmakers. Um, that being said, uh, there was a group um, of about 20 watchmakers who founded the Central Electronic Horloger, the CEH, um, and it was founded specifically to create uh, quartz movements uh, that would be small enough to fit inside a wristwatch. So here are the five gentlemen here who um, were the engineers who made the movement. And over here, you can see the CEH watch. And if you can see that, it says beta 21 at the bottom. So the beta 21 movement was the first Swiss quartz movement. Um, Here's a diagram of it here. Um, we'll go into more details about what all of these uh, circuits and things are a little bit later. Um, but this was a very, very well um, and accurate 
uh, movement, and a lot of the very big brands adopted it, including Patek Philippe, who used it in its their reference 3587 watch. Um, all of these particular watches were introduced at Basel in 1970. Um, in addition to Patek Philippe, Omega introduced its electro quartz and the Royster, Royster, Royster quartz 5100 also carried the beta movement. Only 6,000 of these movements were made. So after they were used within these watches, they were kind of gone and the Swiss really didn't concentrate on trying to produce more. Um, if you're a collector out there, you'll know that if you have a watch with a beta movement, that's pretty cool and, and worth a lot of money now. So other Swiss quartz movements would follow in the coming years. However, the ongoing robust sales of their mechanical watches, quartz wasn't really much of a focus for the Swiss brands. They knew of the quartz movements being produced in Japan. Storm clouds were brewing far to the east in Japan with the production of quartz movements. Unfortunately, the Swiss greatly underestimated the threat. Swiss brands didn't think quartz watches would impact their market share that much. Shares, sales were good after all, business was booming. They couldn't have been more wrong. Here we are, here is a graph of the fall of the 1970s. So if you see here um, in 1970, let's see, that's 72, there are about 86,000 watches being uh, made in Switzerland every year. Now look at this. It rock bottom of about 82 at around 30,000 timepieces. Gradually, it recovered, and now we're seeing a slide down again right before the year 2000. What's interesting, though, is while these uh, fluctu fluctuation and unfortunate downturn of uh, production, you see that there's a steady rise in the value of the Swiss watches. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm getting too far away from the thing. Okay, sorry. Um, all right. So, terrible thing. And here comes the storm cloud from Japan, moving slowly but steadily from Japan all the way over to Switzerland. All right, so we're talking about the Japanese uh, quartz watches. The first one that was introduced uh, was the Seiko Astron. It was a quartz watch, um, and it was a limited edition of just 200 pieces. And the price of it in today's dollars was $9,500. It had, um, you know, all the quartz movements and. Uh, it was it sold like hotcakes, um, collector's item today still. Um, very clean look to the watch, nothing sort of extraordinary. What was extraordinary was inside. So here's a look at the, a Seiko quartz movement of the period. You can see how it's sort of round and a little bit, it's hard to tell, but it's a bit flatter than uh, the beta movement, which is to its left. So. You can see how the beta movement is like a little more rudimentary, although it definitely was getting the job done. Whereas Seiko, you know, was just looking smoother and better. Um, so the big thing that is uh, what we want to talk about today is the actual piece of quartz that's inside these watches. The quartz is what makes the watches so very uh, reliable and accurate. Okay, so here is a picture of the very small piece of quartz that's in a quartz watch. Look at that in comparison to a dime. 
it's quite tiny. And this little quartz has the capacity of uh, vibrating 32,768 times per second. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about comparative frequencies and I want to do a little, uh, let's say a little science experiment um, demonstration while, while we're talking about this. Um, so what we're going to be doing is passing around some tuning forks to demonstrate the rate of vibration of uh, tuning forks of a larger size compared to that little one there. So as you can see, um, here's some other frequencies that we know in the natural world. A hummingbird's wings can flap at a rate of 70 times per second. Bees can flap their wings up to 230 times per second. Tuning forks that we're hang, handing around can go anywhere from 256 to 512 times per second. Um, whoever has a tuning fork, can you chime them maybe in order one through eight so we can get the different levels of sound? Once you hit it, you can also hear and feel the vibrations when it's close to your ear. Now imagine that 10,000 times more per second. So how is it possible that such a small piece of quartz can vibrate so very quickly? The answer is scientific, of course. Um, happened back in the 1880s when Marie and Pierre Curie, who were famous scientists, discovered that um, if a quartz crystal was hit, it turned the energy of the impact into electricity. This quality is called piezoelectric. It's an electric charge that accumulates after some mechanical stress is applied. When a piece of quartz is compressed or bent, it generates an electric charge on its surface. It can also work the other way. If a small electric charge gets onto the surface of the quartz, it will vibrate. Quartz is very durable and is highly resistant to temperature. So it makes an ideal um, part for a watch. It's pretty impermeable. Here, I'm gonna show you guys a small uh, movie kind of explaining how this quartz watch works. ...holds the heart of this watch. Inside lies a tiny quartz tuning fork. I have one. Now, it's so tiny that I keep it in this white cap. You can see it right there in the center. Now, although this modern circuitry is vital to the watch, it's based on the same principles of the first clocks built in the 17th century resonant motion. It's easiest seen in the pendulum clock. This family heirloom that hung in the living room when I was a kid uses the motion of a pendulum to keep time. Now, this pendulum oscillates with a regular period that runs a clockwork that translates this motion into movement of the hands. There are many ways to create resonant motion. For example, a tuning fork. This one vibrates 440 times a second. That's an A note when struck. I love that sound. Now, if I slow down the motion of the fork, you can see how the tines move back and forth with a regular period. That's resonant motion, like the pendulum, which can be used to measure time. The quartz crystal I showed from inside this watch is a tiny tuning fork. It vibrates at about 30,000 times per second. But how do you get it to vibrate? And how do you measure its vibrations or record its vibrations? I mean, we cannot get a hammer in there to hit the quartz crystal. The engineer who designed this digital watch used something known as the piezoelectric effect to make the small tuning fork vibrate. You can see this piezoelectric effect most easily with Rochelle salt. Here at the center lies the crystal. I've attached two electrodes made of tinfoil and strung wire from them to a small ball. Watch what happens as I strike the crystal with a hammer. As I deform the crystal, it generates a current. 
The reverse also happens. If you place a voltage across the crystal, it deforms. This is how the quartz tuning fork and the watch is pinged. A voltage from the battery sets it in motion, and then the watch's circuitry measures the current fluctuations that represent the resonant motions of the tines. Quartz is ideal for digital watches because of its outstanding physical hardness and mechanical and chemical stability. And that stability makes this watch work nearly anywhere on Earth and under all but the most extreme conditions. One more interesting thing about these digital watches is how these tiny tuning forks are made. On a production line, engineers must make these quartz tuning forks so accurate that they vibrate at 32,768 times a second, plus or minus one six hundredths, about two parts per million in frequency. If that frequency differs by one six hundredth, the watch will be off by more than one minute a year. And to see how they tune these forks, look at the ends. You see deposits of gold at the ends of the tines. These are added to make the fork's vibrational frequency too low. On the production line, a laser zaps tiny bits of the gold off until the frequency of vibration is just right. It's a wonder that these magnificent engineered objects are so inexpensive. I'm Bill Hammock, the Engineer Guy. All right. So, holds the heart of this watch. Okay. So, to put that in a nutshell, um, here's a diagram that can sort of better explain it visually. Um, so, number one is the battery, okay? The battery provides the current, the energy, to the microchip circuit, which is that green rectangle. The microchip, microchip cir circuit uh, makes the quartz crystal vibrate at exactly 32,768 times per second. That electricity then goes back into the microchip to feed into this uh, number four, which is sort of the crank to help move the watch's uh, hands. It's called an electric stepping monitor. It converts the electricity into mechanical power. The electric stepping motor turns the gears. And then the gears move the watch's hands around the dial to display the time. Okay, so now we know a little bit about this. Let's go back to the Japanese and their quartz watch boom. Okay, our old friend Seiko was an early leader in quartz watch production, making about three quarters of all the Japanese quartz watches. Seiko's watch revenues in 1977 were $700 million. They produced more than 18 million watches. Timex actually produced more watches at 35 million, but it took in just $475 million during that year. Here are two examples of early Seiko quartz watches. The watch on the left has a dial that's called the Morpho dial. Anybody familiar with that one? Yes? Are you wearing it? All right, okay, let's, uh, let's take a look at that after. Um, so the Morpho dial kind of goes from green to blue depending on the light that it's in, right? I've actually never seen one in person. Um, and on the right, we have a Seiko Grand Quartz um, circa around the same time period of 1975. Here's a funny Timex ad. Um, Timex also was making a killing in the quartz watch business. Um, so that's a $50 watch in, let's say, 1997. Today, it would cost about $244. When we go to buy a Timex watch today, we think it's going to be, what, 25, 30, 35 maximum. Um, and then early quartz watches were priced higher because there just wasn't quite the volume out there at the beginning to supply all of the demand. After um, the analog, which means that the watch hands move around the dial, um, come all of these digital displays. And the digitals prove to be even more successful than uh, the analog quartz watches. Um, as you can see, there's just tons of functions they have. Um, the early ones were sort of more calendar driven. 
Um, as you see the one on the right, you've got your calendar, you've got your laps, counting, um, stopwatch, all of these uh, functions on your wrist. Um, we have a lot more in our Apple Watches today, but uh, that was pretty cool back then. Citizen also at this point was getting into the act. It's another huge company that we know of in Japan. Um, and they also were putting out um, eventually a bunch of analog, whoops. Sorry. Analog watches here. You can see a little bit of the movement there. And then I think these are pretty funny because they combine an analog watch display with the digital. So you're looking at a normal clock, you're looking at whatever the digital says and seconds and I don't know. I think I would get confused just looking at it, but it's cool, it's a toy, right? Um, okay, so some more bad news. Here we have on the left, you can see in this graph, that uh, by 1979, the annual watch sales in Japan surged to almost 60,000 pieces. There you go. By comparison, the Swiss watch production had fallen to 30,000. The Swiss needed to take swift action or the industry would really collapse. Rebuilding, here we're going on to rebuilding the Swiss watchmaking, which is a long road to recovery. The major uh, ways to do this were to consolidate many of the companies, streamline the production processes, uh, reestablish Swiss watches as a with superior quality and emphasize the heritage of Swiss watchmaking and trying to find some more affordable ways to offer more affordable Swiss watches. Now there were hundreds of small mom and pop businesses working independently, sources from very various suppliers. Um, this process was very inefficient and it was clear that they needed to consolidate. So one of the first, I would say, outstanding men to help bring it all together was Ernest Thump. Now you remember he actually was part of, or the director of the CEH, which is the company that made the Beta 21 movement. Um, Mr. Tomka consolidated a lot of um, brands under one roof, um, and his idea was to, again, make this luxury watch, a luxury Swiss watch, um, but combine it with the quartz movement. So most Swiss watches before then, if they were cased in gold, they'd have a mechanical movement. Um, but these Concords were one of the first to actually have, you know, full glass uh, gold case, full uh, gold bracelet, um, and they were made of quartz. So the value proposition here has shifted from the mechanics to the aesthetics. Um, marketing. Nicholas Hayek to the rescue. So the New York Times has uh, described Mr. Hayek as a flamboyant figure who saved the Swiss watch industry with the introduction of the swatch. Forbes said he was a legend credited with engineering the rebirth of the Swiss watch industry. So Mr. Hayek was called in by three major Swiss banks to try them. They were desperately trying to save the watch industry and looked for outside consulting. He had never worked in the watch business before. And so he came in kind of knowing nothing but having a lot of uh, business acumen. Um, so what he had to say was, it's not just possible to build mass market products in Switzerland, it's necessary. 
we must build where we live. So he's talking about these quartz washes that were mass produced in other countries. And it's necessary that it happens now in Switzerland. We must build where we build where we live. When a country loses the know-how and expertise to manufacture things, it loses its capacity to create wealth and its financial independence. So Mr. Hayek did what he wanted to do. He tried to, he figured out how to build a mass market product. And for some, they think he's the superhero of the, uh, the recovery of the Swiss watch industry. Um, so now I wanna ask, does anybody know the origin of the name Swatch? Anybody wanna guess? Right, second watch. So with, when Mr. Hayek conceived of this, this watch, he thought, okay, this is gonna be the second watch that somebody's gonna buy, right? You have your first watch, which is your nice mechanical watch. And this is your second watch that you wear on the weekends or whatever, but it's not gonna be the first watch that you buy. But it also has a connotation, especially in English of Swiss watch. For years, I thought it was Swiss and watch combined. Um, so it had that effect on me. And then of course, the logo has this, the uh, Swiss flag attached to it. So this, it was just a wonderful feat of marketing and you know, sort of connecting Switzerland back with great watches. another early swatch um, and here we have uh, a whole group of prototypes uh, that were made in uh, around 1981 so you can see that swatch was experimenting with square um, shapes round dates no dates uh, dark dials light dials um, so there were a lot of options but the main point here was these watches were made of plastic. Okay, the plastic strap, plastic dial, plastic quartz. They were kind of throwaway watches, if you will. Um, so anyway, this was something new for the Switzerland at least. Um, the first Swatch watch that actually came out is this one. Um, it's sort of a wine red um, color. And these are of course, highly collectible by now. Recently Swatch, which is still going strong, although it did have a bit of a dip. Um, these watches here are Swatch watches that are made with 100% um, uh, vegetable oriented, natural, um, naturally sourced uh, components. Um, so yeah, so Swatch in two years sold 2,500,000 pieces. This was quite an achievement for the industry that was basically crashing. Lost my place. Um, by 1985, the plastic, brightly colored, inexpensive, and highly popular watch gave the Swiss watch industry a much needed boost. By 1985, two years after the Swatch was introduced, the Swiss watch industry had partially rebounded from the depths of the crisis. In the short time between 1983 and 1985, production numbers swelled. The industry was firmly on the way to recovery. And here we can see steady growth in the value and production of the Swiss watches. That's slow and steady, but it's going there. Thank you all. Uh, I hope you enjoyed the presentation.
anybody has any questions, I think we're going to open it up to questions. Yes. First of all, thank you so much again for lecturing uh, our first lecture back from summer. It's really nice to see everybody, some familiar faces, some not familiar faces. So it's great to have everyone here. Um, thank you again. And yes, now we're going to open up the floor for some Q&A. So if anyone has a question, just raise your hand and I'll come over to you. Question in the back. Okay. Hi. Um, thank you so much for your talk. I just had a question about, so basically this, this was, we're talking about this crisis in the Swiss watch industry, but obviously it was a moment of huge growth for the Japanese watch industry among others. So I wonder how like Japanese history talks about this. Well, did it create a huge number of jobs there? Is it seen as like a huge post-war, you know, revolution or, or how is it seen from that point of view? Yes, so in fact, you're right. Um, in Japan, it was celebrated as, as this, you know, amazing growth industry. Um, as we all know, Japan was decimated during the war um, and trying to get back on its feet in so many ways. And um, Japanese people were very, very determined to make this quartz movement happen. And uh, a lot of money and a lot of brain know-how um, went into it and they really focused on this and it is in fact something that the Japanese uh, tout as one of their big accomplishments during that time period. Great, thank you so much for that. Um, thank you for the lecture, very informative. Uh, so I guess more speaking in line with that, uh, could you I guess going back to what you had mentioned right where it was a sudden drop in the number of Swiss companies right so it just occurs to me, at least at the surface level, that a lot of them really, not only did they not see that storm coming, a lot of them just simply didn't seem to care, right? So it's it seems more of like a like a attitude of affluence. It's like, no one's gonna top us, you know, it's like, we're the best. And then all of a sudden a country comes in that's mastered, you know, resource management, you know, like Toyota story is like a just-in-time approach where no resource is wasted. And then here comes in, you know, super accurate watches that are beating them at this at a production value. So could you speak more on some of those Swiss companies that did survive and like what was the culture change for that where they had to get make that transition from more of like this bespoke, you know, high complication one person one watch towards transitioning towards like that high efficiency, you know, automation, you know, competing with this more, you know, globalized market. Thank you. Sure. Um, so the companies that did survive um, during the crisis were companies that had decided to band together as we were talking about these consortiums that were um, that were formed um, and the, the companies that were had their own wealth they were independent of stockholders and the banks um, a lot of them just continued business as usual um, a good example is Patek Philippe, right? It's family owned, amazing reputation around the world. Um, they're not going from, you know, hand to mouth with the money. You know, they've, they've got a good solid foundation of uh, financial resources and watchmaking resources. So what Patek Philippe did actually is during these down years, they created their two most complicated watches to date. Um, one of them, I, I wish I knew the exact name of them, but so rather than trying to create watches that were for the many that could generate some easy sales and they actually um, went completely the opposite way and said, okay, we're gonna take our know-how and we're gonna make something even better. You know, we're gonna push ourselves even farther. Um, and so, that eventually, obviously, as we know, Patek Philippe is hugely um, successful company, most highly respected in the world. Um, so they stayed the course, you know, um, trying to think of another example. Well, we've got Rolex. Again, Rolex was a very successful brand before the crisis. Um, they did start having oyster quartz watches, but again, they, um, 
they were so big that um, this kind of dip in profits did not completely derail them. So while they might have cut production, um, they were able to hold their own and make it make it through the crisis. Great, thank you so much. Any more questions up here? Thank you, that was a super interesting retrospective. I was just curious what you saw the biggest threats to switch watch, Swiss watchmaking today. I see Apple watches everywhere now. Is that something on your radar um, or do you see that as a completely separate segment? Well, um, as a watch writer and journalist, I've been going to the Basel and Geneva fairs for a very long time. The Apple, the first Apple watch came out right before the annual Basel watch fair, which is Patek Philippe shows there and Rolex and lots of the really top brands. And all anybody was talking about was the Apple watch. I mean, people were scared um, and didn't know what you know was going to go on, um, and so there was a lot of fear in the beginning within the industry. Um, the Apple Watch was also sort of at a sweet spot um, price range, where a lot of sort of the middle priced uh, mechanical watch watches were priced. So six hundred dollars, nine hundred dollars, thousand dollars. There are a lot of brands in that range that you know. So if you had your six hundred dollars, you're going to buy an Apple watch or you're going to buy a mechanical watch, right? So, um, and then there are a lot of people who said, well, it's not even a watch, right? It's a computer that you wear on your wrist. It's not a watch, forget it. Like, we don't need to pay any attention to it. So for the first few years, it definitely made a big dent in the watches that were in the same price category. Um, and that was very devastating. Um, after that, in recent years, I think, you know, some of the novelty of the Apple Watch has worn off. So no, nobody's like running out or some people are, but like the, we don't need the latest Apple Watch every time a new one comes out, right? So when the Apple Watches first came out, everyone wanted to have one, but now everyone did probably have one who wanted one. Um, and so they didn't need to get another one. And, the novelty of it uh, just sort of wore off. In the meantime, we've also seen um, a big interest in people buying vintage timepieces. So a vintage timepiece really has nothing to do with something that's been made yesterday. Um, and these are seen as pieces of jewelry for men and women. Um, the mechanics inside are something that people are really interested in. Um, and so uh, there have been so many uh, websites now that are just carrying thousands and thousands of vintage watches. And it's become really cool to wear a vintage watch. Um, so I think after the first shock in the watch industry and the sort of panic um, and the initial like everyone had to have one, now things are sort of calming down. Um, people who want to have their Apple Watch have their Apple Watch, but it's not precluding them from buying a mechanical watch if they want to, because now it's not an either or. You already have the Apple. You see what I mean? Does that answer your question? Good. We have an online question. We've got a couple online questions. Uh, Steve Murphy asks, do you have a favorite pre-Quartz brand that did not make it through the Quartz crisis? Gosh, you know, I don't, um, I, I don't. Um, a lot of the brands were so small that um, their names have sort of been lost. Um, there are some brands that, um, were lost sort of during the wars and were revived later, like La Suta and Langa and Zona. Um, so I, I don't really have a brand that comes to mind that was lost. Does anybody here in the audience have one that they, yeah. Universal Genève. 
Uh, thank you for that. And we have uh, one other online question. This is from Douglas McFarland. Douglas asks uh, for Swatch, was it more about the aesthetics uh, or was it a new form of horology in your opinion? It was all about the aesthetics. I think the Swatch watch was made to be fun and frivolous, sort of a no brainer to buy. Um, it cost you 40 bucks or whatever. It's, it's fun to look at. You can have a plain one. You could have one with Mickey Mouse on it or Donald Duck. And so, um, you know, the mechanics were quartz mechanics, like the ones that we've been speaking about tonight. Um, but the Swatch watch really became sort of a, a style sensation. Um, and so I think that's where the biggest, uh, was the biggest motivator for sales. Thank you. Okay, last call for questions. All right. Uh, in your opinion, uh, what do you attribute the rise in popularity, I'd say maybe in the last 25 to 30 years uh, of the mechanical watch again? Um, you know, because obviously there's still quartz watches, but a lot of the brands that we are talking about are kind of reinvented from pre-quartz times. And just want to know what you think has, has really been a, a driving force behind that. That's a good question. So I think um, there have always been a group of people who are into watches and they know mechanical watch from a quartz watch, right? And so... But over time, as people have become more educated, and I will say that some of these websites out there like Hodinkee and others of its ilk are really pushing this idea of mechanical watches being special, you know, and they're special because of what's going on inside here. You've got your gears, you've got um, all of these other parts, tiny parts that are working together. Um, and so 25 years ago, I think, you know, for my brother, for example. So I've been talking to him for watches, about watches forever. And I want him to get, you know, a Patek Philippe or another mechanical watch. And he just says to me, like, I, I don't want to have to deal with winding it. Like, I don't, I don't want to get one of those. And like, I can't convince him, you know, it's kind of you either want it or you don't. But I think there's been a real uh, uptick in people who now want a mechanical watch because they understand what's going on inside there and they appreciate that craftsmanship. Fantastic. Okay, we'll take one last question. I think we will. Uh, firstly, thanks for your talk. It was very interesting. Um, sort of piggybacking off of some of the other questions earlier. Today, we really see quartz watches still from these storied brands that seemingly dip their toes in quartz a little bit and then kind of came out of it later, the Patek Philippe, Omega, et cetera. But you still very much see quartz watches as what's driving what we would consider the ladies formats, right? The smaller case sizes, et cetera, despite the fact that JLC has been making super tiny movements for a hundred years, yeah. right? Do we mm -hmm. think that that's, I suppose, when did that trend emerge? Do we see that trend reversing? Was that really out of necessity? Like, you know, they don't, maybe it was less uh, efficient to make the smaller movements at that, at that time, or maybe still is now just less demand, or you know, is that a trend we could see reversing soon in the future as uh, people sort of rediscover the smaller case sizes, et cetera? Right, so as you mentioned, the JLC movements back in the day when their women's watches were tiny, and um, the watches were very slim and thin and of course, they were all manually wound. Um, and as I had said earlier in my lecture, people were just, they were used to winding up their watches. That's just how it worked, right? So before the 60s, a lot of these watches, and especially back then, women's watches were sort of really separated from men's. Now we're seeing them more as sort of unisex in some areas. Um, when quartz came upon the world. Um, I think for some of these uh, watches that are sort of catered or dictated to women, um, women may see these watches more as a piece of jewelry than uh, a piece of mechanics. You know, if you've got a diamond studded 
uh, Vacheron Constantin. Um, you might not wear it every day on the weekend. Um, so then you put it in your drawer and then it comes out when you're going out to dinner and it has stopped if it has a mechanical uh, movement. So then you have to go and take care of it like we talked about before. Um, and so if, if a watch is looked at more like a piece of jewelry, the owner might not have that same sort of connection to the mechanics of it. Um, so I think it's, it's convenience um, for people who have a lot of watches and they just don't wanna deal. But if you're into watches, um, mechanical, is the way to go. I actually, I thought I would never buy a quartz watch again, but I did buy this swatch because of, uh, of the uh, lecture tonight. Did that answer your question? Okay, okay. All right, Hyla, thank you so much again for lecturing at HSNY. If we can all give her one more round of applause. Thanks everybody. Thanks, thank you. So Hila is gonna be sticking around for a little bit. Um, for everybody else, thank you so much for joining us. Um, we have another lecture coming up next month. We'll send more information soon, um, but thank you and get home safe. <laughs>